500,000 people will be making Canada its new home every year until the year 2025. This was announced recently by the immigration minister, Sean Fraser, recently. While this is great news in addressing the labor shortages, as well as fueling the economic growth of Canada, but this also means that the incoming influx, newcomers will need a lot of support and a powerful ecosystem, especially when it comes to finding jobs and to break and succeed into tech. My name is Rasham Katyal, and as immigrant myself, I am proud and blessed to be part of an organization that not only believes in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but is committed to bringing change regarding these initiatives. Tech Nation is committed to provide opportunities for emerging talent, and with our Career Ready program alone, we have supported thousands of newcomers in providing opportunities and finding jobs. Today, I'm delighted to be in conversation with other such trailblazers from the industry who have created a welcoming and inclusive workspace for newcomers. Please join me in welcoming my wonderful panels. I'll start with Basil Romley. Basil is a co-founder of Jumpstart Refugee Talent, and together with Talent Beyond Boundaries, he helps companies to hire and relocate uh, tech talent from displaced populations across the world. Also join me in welcome Hani Aljujan. Hani is the gentleman who wears multiple hats. He's a lawyer and he's an entrepreneur. Together with his uh, law company Emerge, he leverages technology in making tech more and law more accessible to startups and entrepreneurs. He also has a new age media influencer marketing company. And it makes me extremely happy to say that our career ready students has played a significant role in the success for both his ventures. Also join me in welcoming Anfri. Anfri is the CEO of Data Action. Anfri immigrated to Canada 15 years ago and started his own career in the banking sector. Today, he ventured into tech entrepreneurship. And again, every team member, I believe seven uh, team members, everyone is a newcomer, again, thanks to Career Ready. And last but not the least, also join me in welcoming Cynthia Nonso. Cynthia is a newcomer and internationally educated professional. She migrated to Canada from Nigeria together with her family in 2021. And Scale Without Borders utilized ADAPT, a digital skills program, as well as Career Ready, and hired her as um, a technical recruitment specialist. Welcome, everyone. So excited to have you. Quick house rule, I am very excited to have, you know, um, an interesting conversation with all these people and ask a lot of questions. Having said that, I love to take questions from the audience in the, uh, as well in the end. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll take them later. So jumping right into it, and perhaps my first question is for you, Basil, and starting with sort of, you know, the big why. So why do you think it is so important for all the companies in Canada to commit to hiring immigrants as part of their corporate social responsibility? And to that effect, what recommendations or advice would you have uh, for organizations which want to provide opportunities to newcomers? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so thank you, Rashim, uh, for having us here. And thank you for also Scale Without Borders. So I would say definitely we have a straightforward answer. We always talk about diversity and inclusion be being two core values that we celebrate as Canadians and companies should want to associate themselves with that. Uh, but there are also the more tangible direct benefits. We do live in a country that relies on immigration. As you mentioned, our target now is to welcome 500, half a million immigrants a year. Uh, about a quarter of the population currently is made up of immigrants and the number is only growing. And in a city like Toronto, more than, well now roughly half of the population was born outside of the country. So newcomers are really clients uh, for these companies. And as a company, you can conduct market research to learn a little bit more about how you can target these markets, how to learn a little bit more about these clients, but what a better way to learn more uh, than potentially uh, about your potential clients than to just really hire uh, from them. Uh, also, these employees can be a great asset when companies are exploring expansion internationally. Uh, we're also in an economy that is uh, relying heavily on adaptability. 
just two years ago in March of 2020, so many of us had to uh, start working from home all of a sudden and had to adapt to that. Well, I mean, immigrants really shine in economies like that. And this is, uh, they've left behind successful careers. They left behind families, friends, loved ones. They made a, a decision to restart everything, uh, adapt to living in a new culture, uh, learn a new language, learn new skills and make new friends. Uh, so, I mean, there are, we can just go on and on about the values that really immigrants bring. And ultimately the question becomes to me more of why not hire immigrants uh, than why hire immigrants. That is so true. And it's so interesting that you bring up this aspect about, you know, the, the journey that need, they need to make with regards to learning a new language and things like that. And this brings me to another really relevant point. And this also came up in the summit yesterday about, you know, newcomers coming in and the aspect of sort of cultural fit, right? Or the barrier around cultural fit. So perhaps this question I would ask you, Hani, you know, and especially, you know, this whole pressure uh, of cultural fit, newcomers often end up sort of pushing down or toning down a little bit of who they really are. You know, we, we spoke about one of the speakers at the panel said yesterday that we've all seen instances where they try to sort of edit their CVs to change their name, to remove any aspects of culture. So when companies actually reject candidates based on cultural fit, what they're most likely doing is sort of looking for, you know, some kind of homogeneous setup or looking to sort of maintain the status quo that regards to race, gender, uh, you know, socioeconomic um, status. So what would be your recommendations? So how do we really evolve? If you're a company and you're looking for talent, how do you get rid of this intrinsic unconscious bias and sort of hire the individual for the difference or the value that they bring in? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that question. So I wanna start off by saying, I think it's like by human nature, we all want to just fit in, right? So as a newcomer or as an immigrant, you're, you're going into this organization, you're like, okay, how do I try to, fit in or be as same or similar to them as possible. And so you see a lot of people trying to change their name or edit it and try to kind of like, I, like, I don't want to say like Canadianize because it's not like Canadian can mean different things, but it's to that person what that means. Whereas I do believe that it's really the organization's role and responsibility to be as inclusive as possible. And for you, as someone who has, who's, who's lucky enough to have a different culture and a different and bring something different to the table, I would own that. And I feel like a lot of uh, newcomers and immigrants, they need to understand that it is actually an advantage for them, right? You are bringing so many different perspectives. If you traveled and you, you know, you've had different types of experiences, use that, leverage on that. Because I do remember even as when I was going through the recruitment process, something as simple as, you know, trying to really pretend that I like hockey, even though I have no interest in hockey, but I thought that's going to get me in. And then when I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go in and say, I really have no idea what's going on in this game, but I'm here to talk and meet people. Even it brought so much pressure off of me because it wasn't me trying to be someone I'm not. I was just trying to be as authentic as possible. Uh, and so my advice is really just be who you are and own it. And for organizations, really trying to define what cultural fit is to really include and have an accurate definition that is inclusive enough to encompass different personalities and different cultures and different people. So that would be my answer. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing that hockey story. And I think we've all heard a lot of examples like this as well. And to just sort of that effect, and Fernie, I want to ask you from your perspective, you know, somebody who's given opportunities to seven newcomers in your team, do you have anything to share, any success stories, any anecdotes perhaps that come to your mind with regards to, uh, you know, success or, you know, let's say newcomers bringing in with international wealth of knowledge and, you know, how that can lead to sort of innovation and success in your company. So anything that you'd like to share with our audience? And yes, of course, and before that, you can hear me okay, right? Always, yeah, always want to make sure my pull tool works fine. But yeah, I want to first echo, I mean, it's like uh, things about hockey, right? For so long, me in Canada, I still don't know how hockey, hockey works. But 
I still go to event like uh, friends like watch hockey and I still drink with it and then I think but then I also see like uh, people being pressured they want to fit in they need to fit in this for me like I still don't bother with hockey but I still celebrate with the people who watch hockey I'm here just for drink drink and chill with friends but now back to the success of story right I think I was given like, two examples first is ours and um, one is just another fellow entrepreneur I met in Waterloo like, and then we, because we both benefit a lot from new immigrants, right? I think the see, the thing we've been seeing just because of through technician, we had the opportunity to recruit like a post, like a domestic, like a student going through this and then also newcomer graduate, right? We see like, there's a pattern, like it's more predictable and then things so when we see when we hire students from the domestic and they grew up here, I mean, they sort of think and behave like, and then so you don't really kind of, you don't really get a kind of spark out of it, at least from our case. And then from like, we have like uh, immigrants from several countries like uh, this, right? And then because they know what's happening in their market. And then I started to learn more about kind of what are the potential opportunities and things they've seen, which I never had, ne never had a chance to see, right? So that's one thing I've learned a lot. And then also the same with other faithful entrepreneurs, right? For their company, especially for startup, we are always about kind of creating like a finding solution to the challenge we are kind of conquering, right? So and we need that kind of different element to kind of spark our thinking. And same with at least like the two, three other entrepreneurs I just encountered in the past year, their company has been formed majority, if not all, with all new immigrants, just because the perspective they are bringing from Europe, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and even Africa, right? It's like uh, things we've never seen, never heard. And then sometimes it just like goes, okay, yeah, that's a good perspective. And I think the keys for us, we build a, Sort of start like a platform for everyone. So like a, for me, I know enough about Canadian or North American, and I know enough about Chinese like this. But then we want to go global. Right? I think for startup, a, a lot of start, a spirit tech startup, we are really aiming outside of Canada. We are not building a tech startup to just kind of play in Canadian market at least for like a platform wise. Right? So I think recruiting them really helped me and the number of startups like uh, happened. And, and one of the famous example I've been hearing again and again, it brought out, was brought out yesterday as well, apply for, apply for, I mean, they kind of globally, they were able to scale out just because they utilized the new immigrants, like immigrants and all the global talents, right? I think for Canadian tech startup, mm -hmm. being able to kind of work with the immigrant and all the foreign talents, I think that's the key for us to really get out of market. Uh, at the end of the day, Canadian market is too small for us. And we need to be ready. And it's rather be ready early rather than late, later. For sure. Absolutely. And, and I love how you said that, you know, they sort of bring in different perspectives. And that's exactly my point as well, that I feel diversity of thought is actually a big contributor in leading to innovation, right? So I know, Honey, in both your ventures as well, both in Yala and Emerge Law, I wonder if you have something to share uh, with us as well and how, how you were able to see that in your businesses. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to a lot of the student talent, I do recall one specific uh, student. So right from the beginning, three years ago, he actually is a, was an international student at the beginning, we then became PR from Iran. He was taking so much ownership and initiative and really bringing innovation and really taking lead on certain projects. And it's been three years working with that person and you can see the growth and he really has started building a, a name for himself. And now we have another project that we're working on and a tech component on Yalla. And he's now like pretty much, even though officially not yet, but like the CTO of that project. So it's really cool to see someone so young doing some great things. The other aspect I want to also mention when it comes to, to students and taking ownership. And I think this is a this is also something for employers, more so for um, for people who are looking for jobs, is to, to realize that uh, when it comes to a lot of these as immigrants and newcomers, there are certain needs and certain challenges that they are also facing and to really accommodate and provide a safe environment for them. So uh, for example, uh, discussing mental health and personal development and knowing and providing them links to resources, I think it's something that's that's uh, understated and should be something that should be emphasized, especially when we're recruiting students and newcomers um, and knowing that there are specific resources for mental health source, uh, for mental health, that is tailored towards newcomers and immigrants, and directing them towards that. So that's just something I just wanted to add for employers as well. 
Excellent. No, that is so good that you point that out because clearly mental health is really in the forefront of anything and everything that you're doing. And I love the CDO example as well. And then this sort of brings me to sort of a broader question about like, you know, when you're bringing immigrant talent in, clearly there are a lot of stakeholders uh, involved from the word go, you know, especially with regards to, I would say, government and policies and procedures. So Basil, perhaps you can enlighten us a little bit about what policies or initiatives do you think should be in place or are in place from the government, which sort of helps newcomers with regards to job initiatives and how can this sort of find relevant jobs in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, it's amazing that we're looking to welcome half a million uh, uh, immigrants a year, but that also comes with a big responsibility uh, to support uh, these individuals, uh, to support the economy and the employers here. Uh, again, RBC, I believe they published a study where they estimate that unemployment and underemployment when it comes to newcomers cost the economy about $30 billion a year uh, and just lost income. So we really have to look at that where we know that, uh, you know, newcomers are twice as likely to be unemployed as a Canadian and they're much more likely to be underemployed as well. So the idea would be, how can we look at that? You know, there are many issues. Some of it we've already discussed. Uh, Hanny has already brought it up, or she brought it up. So there is that unconscious biases when it's a culture fit. Somebody, when you're interviewing, you'd like to interview uh, or work with someone that looks a bit like you, that thinks a bit like you. So there are these unconscious biases. Do you like hockey? Well, maybe I like soccer, but maybe that's fine. And there are maybe a lot of people now in Canada like soccer as well, or whatever the sport might be. Uh, but there are also conscious biases that we need to overcome. And there are policies that need to be in place uh, to really help uh, support that. Uh, one of those biases, I think number one barrier is uh, the lack of Canadian work experience. So many employers out there say, we're not gonna offer you a job without a work, a Canadian work experience. Well, I mean, that's kind of a problem because you also need a job to get a Canadian work experience. And we're in this, just this loophole. So we need to have policies in place to really encourage employers to rethink and reevaluate uh, their recruitment processes, their job descriptions, and the way they talk to their hiring managers and to their recruiters. Uh, and that's really just part one part of it. And then there is the other part where it's about you know, sometimes you are going to have some of these employers that are not going to be uh, taking a, a risk technically is the way that they view it. And then there are a lot of great programs. Uh, I would say, I mean, the one that you work on at Tech Nation with, the, uh, with that, I'm sorry, that trade, the, the SWIP, uh, student wage subsidy program. That's exactly. Right. Uh, so programs like these need to be prioritized by the government. They need to be uh, supported, help people gain some of these experiences. Uh, and just the framework in place to help all these nonprofits like Scale Without Borders is doing some amazing work. We need to have more collaboration between the NGOs that the government fosters uh, that are working across the country to really bring in uh, these uh, nonprofits and also bring in the employers into the design of those uh, uh, recruitment or these employment programming, these upskilling programming. We need to bring in their perspective. They're ultimately a beneficiary of this one. They are an important stakeholder. Uh, so these policies would, would need to look at, you know, how can we A, encourage employers to reevaluate and rethink uh, the way that they do things, but also foster uh, this collaborative framework between uh, NGOs, public sector, and employers to really be able to support these uh, newcomers when they come here. Because ultimately, that's the only way to really capitalize on it and not just bring in uh, an account for such a large opportunity cost. Absolutely. <clears throat> and it's so great that you said that, that it's also really important to sort of look at it from like the newcomers perspective themselves and like they are a stakeholder in all of this, right? So what do they need to upskill? What do they need to sort of train and things like that? So I think this also wants me to capture Cynthia's perspective on this a little bit, Cynthia. Now, I walked in a newcomer's shoes myself, and I know that the journey is definitely not easy. There is a lot to unlearn, learn, relearn, and sort of navigate your life into the whole process. So you, with being a newcomer uh, to now being a woman in tech, Tell us a little bit about your journey. You know, what were the challenges that you encountered? What tools, resources that came into use for you? What is now that is so important that has been instrumental in your success? Thank you very much, Rashim. 
Um, I would like to appreciate what you just said about learning and unlearning. That is the first step for every newcomer, I must observe, because when you come into Canada, probably like I came in as a PR, and it was a rigorous process where we were made to uh, prove our level of experience and educational background. And so you probably be thinking that you have a job waiting for you in Canada when you come. But unfortunately, that is not the case. You have to learn and unlearn. And thankfully, uh, we have agencies like yours, Tech Nation, which really helped me uh, personally to, to, to take advantage of the programs that are there to help newcomers. I, I actually head of um, ADAPT, that's advanced, uh, uh, digi advanced Digital and Professional Training by Ryerson mm -hmm. University, now TMU. And it's, it was the program that helped me to transition into tech today. I work as a recruiter in tech. And before that program, I really didn't know anything about tech. I have worked as a recruiter before. I've worked in human resource. But attending those programs, which six to seven months, you know, you get a, a lot of training and they help you network with employers and learn about the Canadian workplace culture, which is a bit different than what we're used to where we come from. Almost everybody, it's like very uh, different for us. But when you attend such programs and you avail yourself to all these uh, learnings, you realize that it's not as difficult as it seems. Employers meet uh, internationally trained uh, talent on, on such programs. We also have uh, job fairs, which you can see advertised on LinkedIn from time to from a time to time, and so many other resources are out there. I will just advise that newcomers come with an open mindset and take advantage of all the programs they see. Most of, of them are free. Yours is free, uh, Rasheen. We have others which just take a little bit of money or newcomers can apply for financial aid from the government. And this helps them to settle in and get the kind of jobs they are looking for. Not all newcomers have to be underemployed or, or unemployed for a long period of time. Thank you. Excellent. And those are absolutely valuable insights. And I love how you said that while the resources sort of do exist. So yes, I think a little bit onus actually relies on the newcomer themselves to make take advantage of all these programs available. And another theme that came into play uh, yesterday at the summit was about resilience, right? We spoke a lot about resilience and grit and the effort that the newcomer needs to make in sort of their success. And this brings me also a little bit to your uh, journey and Fernie, I know that, you know, we've had these discussions about how when you came and even though it was 15 years ago, you, you struggled with, you know, going through the challenges of finding a job with the big five banks. And I know you also said that mentorship played a huge role in your success of, and, you know, now today to being an educator and to be a tech leader and a community leader yourself. So besides being both, I would say, a mentee and now a mentor, what advice would you have uh, or what would you like to share that has helped you get where you are and for others to be able to succeed in a similar direction? You're a mute, Anne Fernie. <laughs> Well, like uh, surprisingly, after a few years, this kind of mistake still happen all the time. I'm new and new. But yeah, so thank you. Yes, I kind of a few things to for the kind of on my journey. So, and then a story for my first job, like how I got it. So I think in general, I'll say in Canada, Canadians are nice. Canadians love to help people. And that's like uh, back then. And now what has changed is Canadians now understand even more the importance of diversity because they've seen more and more. And there's more like new immigrants in the last 20 years are less and or more, right? So I think that's a key fundamental change. But I want to share the story like when I found my first job, like kind of, it was like a few months after I, I asked my manager, so it was the brokerage job at Scotia Bank. And then I asked Steve, so why did you pick me? And then, well, he has been in the industry for 10 years. He said, it's, a, it's just one of the job. And if not me, then other people, and I was able to like demonstrate to him I work hard and I really mean this is important to me. That's how he paid. He said, yeah, there's a lot of candidates he could choose. So, and then, since then, he has provided me a lot of 
mentorship and coaching support, and that's how I actually start to build my career. And then what I also want to see is like uh, for people, you, you don't necessarily need to kind of love your ways. Okay, I don't have Canadian experience, all those and that, right? So I think just kind of see yourself as yourself. I mean, just be you, just like uh, back to the harness example of, of a hug you. I mean, don't really let, okay, you don't have Canadian experience to block you. Just something you like because like, people would, if you really put in the apple, at the end of the day, whether it's a startup or big corporation, they want to hire people they like and they want, they want to hire people who can perform, right? So if you just be able to show them those, it works. And then along the way, if you really be yourself, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm sure everyone would like to work and help with others being themselves. And then let's say when people like come, come to me for mentorship or like all this, it's like kind of, okay, so I always tell them just like folks on being who you are and don't need to really pretend and then just kind of share that. I think a lot of people like to help and that's just my journey, right? So through every journey, since from the big fight journey to entrepreneurship journey, right? I mean, just kind of focus on being who I am and then people will always be support. I mean, that's one beautiful thing about Canada. Again, on the soul close my comments like, Back then, 15 years ago, I, and then even before, I mean, Canadian has always been known to be very nice. Nice people want to help, but now it's just even better because they have seen a lot more. I mean, now Canada is like really as diversified as like more, more diversified than ever. And then I think immigrants now, I think you don't need to close your door. I mean, people understand the importance of immigrants. I think everyone from all the way to top, like from primary level to also just like a day, daily people, right? Even in diner. People like, okay, to kind of welcome all different cultures. You will see, I mean, I will see like uh, any kind of cuisine, they would go, go there, they will see Chinese and the same with Chinese, see different culture, they will say their language. I said, no, this is us. This is Canada. Like we are built from immigrants. Our success is built with immigrants. So like yeah. just open yourself, don't be shy. People would love to help. Excellent. No, I love that. I love that you say that. Well, just be yourself and, you know, don't be shy. But I, I also want to ask this to you as well, honey, because clearly, <clears throat> you know, you've, you've given opportunities to newcomer for both your firms. So what, what tangible advice comes to your mind in, you know, specific ways of how a newcomer can sort of showcase their uh, transferable skills to the employers out there? I think that's something that many people would be interested in knowing. Okay. Um, first, I just want to start off by saying because there, there's a lot of discussion right now about like Canadian experience and employers asking for that. So I'm going to tell you like from the legal side that unless an employer can show a legitimate reason why they need someone to have Canadian experience, which in some cases it may warrant that, it's actually discriminatory. And it's not something that employers can uh, discriminate against or be like, you need Canadian experience. Now, to, in terms of answering your question, like what could uh, newcomers and immigrants do it's really showing tangible skills i think that's the number one thing because a lot of people come in come and it's not just immigrants or newcomers i think just people in general they're like i can bring business development and strategy and like that's great but that's something that everyone should be bringing in but showcasing what are actual skills that you can bring to the table is what employers are looking for at least i know that's what i'll be looking for like when i when it comes to the media company video editors graphic designers when it comes to the law side, you have experience in terms of, you know, clerical duties, administrative, and, and there's so many things you can actually showcase that you can. And I've, I've, I've interviewed enough uh, people to see how someone can actually spin things. And if you have the right attitude, the right personality, um, and actually not the personality, that right attitude, I would say, and the drive and to be like, I am willing to learn, you're going to be surprised how many doors will open for you because like, I'm just gonna, this is going to be like just on a different tangent, but like, you know, that like uh, that famous meme by Kim Kardashian, it's like nobody wants to work like that is something that we kind of see. So that when people are showing that they actually are wanting to put the work and they have the right skills uh, to do so, the job opportunities are endless. At least that's how I see it. And that's my own opinion. Absolutely. It's all about the right attitude, right? And then, you know, this brings me to another question. I see there is a question in the chat uh, from the audience, perhaps Basil, I believe you could help us answer that. And the question says, and this is from Miraj Ahmed, who says that with the government promoting immigration in flux all over the globe, why are we still facing roadblocks on some companies saying you don't have Canadian experience, even though many of us come from multinational rich experience? Shouldn't the firms or companies and government work together on this? 
Absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. I mean, I did try to address part of it in the previous answer where, yes, there has to be policies in place to encourage uh, these employers. This is, you know, from the public sector, from the government side to really push and encourage employers to reevaluate things. But it also part of our work in the nonprofit sector when we have these conversations with employers. I'm always trying my best to advocate, uh, get them to rethink things. You know, what does it mean to have a Canadian at work experience? What is Canadian? What is not Canadian? Uh, I mean, ultimately, again, you're, you're no longer serving a population that is, that looks and acts the same. It's not, you're not serving a unified culture. Uh, the market that you're serving is quite diverse and it only makes business sense that you should also look to diversify your workforce to accommodate for that. So for me, it makes absolutely no sense for the great majority of occupations. And as Hanny mentioned, that is discriminatory and should be, and it is technically illegal. So uh, yeah, I mean, the, the part that we have to play is just continuous advocacy. And hopefully there could be some policies in place imposed by the government to really push employers in the right direction. So they reevaluate the way they're conducting uh, business when it comes to recruitment, that is. Yeah, clearly there is tons of reevaluation that needs to be in place. And I think I want to ask sort of one final question and love to get final thoughts from all of you with regards to that a little bit about more towards sort of the future of where we're heading you know we came from a world where sort of the impact of COVID was felt largely especially with regards to newcomers you know they're landing in and the world was shut down right so where do you think we're heading with regards to tech talent what about the future of tech talent and what do you really think we'll be talking about at next year's conference uh and Fernie, would you like to give us your quick thoughts on that Yes, I think like uh, I'm a big fan of like a job, right? I mean, people like uh, would just adopt and then this and then for example, like a pretty much most of our the immigrant growing our team, they were from different background, but they know the opportunity is in tech in Canada, so they went back to school to acquire new like a software like a development or data science like a skill, right? I mean, they they had a career, they had a job before. It's not like they didn't have a job, but they know. I mean, they they. Canadian job, but they know if they want to stay in Canada, they want to have a better future for them, themselves, their family. They need to like kind of the new skill. And then I think people just adopt. So like uh, once as as government continue to create an ecosystem for tech, I think new immigrants or even domestic people, they'll say, okay, this is the way they would go, right? So I think I already seen this just in our company and like uh, around and then school and everyone, like including technician, I know technician also focus on tech job, right? So they say, okay, we need to acquire new skill. I think that's also the future of the economy in Canada and every other culture. And I think Canada is doing a great job and the technician is so like being there to keep supporting and the new immigrants, they know they need to upgrade themselves, but not just like uh, stay same old. Yeah, totally. Upgrade, big time. Yes, honey, what would you like to say to that? So one other thing I'd like to just mention is that I feel like just the future of work, there's a lot more now opportunities where people can set up their own shop and become contractors. And this is also another way for you to take ownership and initiative as opposed to just, you know, settling for, for other jobs. There's, you could create your dream job yourself. And I see that a lot in the tech space and other spaces as well. So that's just my, just my input. Yeah. Just create the job that you want. <laughs> Basil, would you like to add something to like that, that as well? Yeah, I would just echo also Anthony's uh, sentiment around really just specialized training and upskilling programming. Right now, we're, we're always headed in the direction where employers are looking for very specific skill sets. So as an immigrant, if I can arrive in the country and my plan is to be to work on the technical side, but maybe it is to work on the product side or even customer success or sales, I would just want to get there to say, this is my intention. And the programs should be, uh, they should be there and they should involve and engage all as employers. There is a big disconnect between what nonprofits and the public sector is offering and sometimes what the employers want to see. So we need to have employer engagement in the design of these programs, have more robust programs that are very specialized. You get in there, you finish, you know, few, few weeks of training, few months of training, uh, it would be components of work placement, including, you know, something like what you do at Tech Nation and so on. So I think it has to be a little bit more comprehensive, uh, robust, and very specialized. Excellent. Brilliant. 
uh, we've hit the clock and this has been an extremely valuable and insightful discussion. So I want to say thank you so much to each one of you for taking the time and inspiring us today. For everyone in the audience, I would say, and I say this on behalf of my panel, do take the time to connect with them. You can see their LinkedIn handles in the profile information. Take the opportunity, introduce yourself, make connections. We're all here today also joining the virtual booths. So drop in, say hi, and you know meet the amazing technician team as well. And you can learn more about our uh, program and services. Thank you so much for listening and have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone.